Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's webinar. Um, Step Change and Safety is very happy to host our Human Factors webinar on Introduction to Learning from Normal Work. Um, so this is a relatively short webinar this morning. Um, we hope to have a number of questions at the end, but any questions that cannot be answered within the time, um, we can answer for you uh, after the event. Um, I wonder if I could ask you if you have any questions, if you could please use the chat function to do that. Um, I think that will save us kind of muting and unmuting individuals. Um, so my name is Carolyn Smith. I'm representing Step Change and Safety this morning. Um, we have Dr. Marsan Nazaruk, who will be presenting for us, um, followed by Q&A towards the end and then uh, a close at 10 o'clock. So with that, I will pass over to Marsa. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you to Step Change in Safety for the opportunity to um, share um, my experience and welcome everyone. I see in the chat that uh, we have guests who joined us from all different parts of the world, including late afternoon and very early mornings. Um, so I really appreciate um, you joining us. Before I move forward. Um, I'd like to share a personal story. Throughout my career, I've seen repeat and surprise accidents, the investigation findings completely missing the point, the inability of corrective actions to make any meaningful improvement, and some big misunderstandings of how human behavior works. I've spent years focusing on how we can learn from accidents, and I developed industry guidance and toolkits on that topic. But as important as it is to learn from failure, it is too late. So I decided to dedicate my efforts to finding ways to learn before accidents happen. I've read hundreds of research papers, collaborated with the biggest names out there, learned from other practitioners. Importantly, I applied it myself and started teaching others. After years of trying to figure out what works and what doesn't, I have distilled the sea of information into a simple framework that enables organization to start learning when nothing goes wrong. And this is something that I would like to share with you today. We will cover three main topics. Introduction to the concept of learning from normal work. I'll show you a number of different examples and then what you can do to start using the industry resources that we've created. So I'll share my screen now. Caroline, if you could kindly confirm if you can see it. Yes, I can see that now. Fantastic, thank you. A few words of my background. My name is Dr. Marcin Nazaruk, and um, I combine industrial psychology with safety, business, and a number of other disciplines. I've worked in different high-risk industries, and I lead multiple industry working groups. I'm the lead author of the IOGP Guide on Learning from Normal Work and the SP Implementation Toolkit. Um, my work resulted in multiple awards, including one specifically for learning from normal work. As part of that effort, I've talked to the dozens, hundreds maybe of leaders about what concerns them um, and how proactive learning relates to that. And this is what they what they said. Senior and executive safety leaders are concerned about repeat and surprise accidents. People hiding information and not saying what's not working. Operational leaders immediately jumping to discipline. Operational costs caused by error or non-compliance. And learning only after failure occurs. Does that resonate with you? When I talked to them about proactive learning, that idea wasn't necessarily new to many of them, but they've expressed a number of uh, frustrations and, and concerns. Many of them would like to do it, but don't know where to start or how to do it in practice. They lacked a simple step-by-step -step framework. They didn't have enough internal experts who could do it, while the using consultants is uh, high cost, sometimes even prohibitive uh, cost. Um, lack of common language and unfamiliar terms 
many haven't seen satisfactory, convincing, practical examples, or tried some tools like learning teams, but it didn't work for them. Attended uh, human performance training, but couldn't introduce it at scale uh, at different sites. Is this your experience too, perhaps? What if you could find out which activities are likely to result in an accident? Get your workers to tell you what is really going on. Find and address the causes of accidents before they happen and make proactive learning part of your culture. Sounds too good to be true. I'll show you how we did it and the resources we created so you can do it too. I use SPE branded slide because many of the uh, slides come from the implementation toolkit. I'll um, tell you more about later. As an industry, we continually learn from incidents and over time we've become safer. The safer we are, the fewer incidents we have to learn from. In reality, the lack of accidents is not a good indicator of how safe we actually are. For example, the largest industry disasters occurred with long-time injury-free operations. Therefore, we need to find a way to learn and improve when unintended consequences are absent. Typically, we think that if a task is completed without an incident, it is a success. Only a very small percentage of all activities result in an undesired event, and the vast majority of activities are completed without a problem. And as a result, it's easy to think that no additional work is needed in the shadow of success. Does it mean, however, that all those activities that didn't result in an event went perfectly? Rarely is attention paid to how the activities were completed, what challenges were encountered, and were seeds of a future accident evident. Learning from normal work, also called pre-accident investigation, learning from the workforce, operational learning, is about proactively looking into things that make work difficult, increase the chances of error, and how dependencies between different groups may contribute to incidents in the future. When there is an accident, it's easy to think that it happened because something went wrong. For example, somebody didn't follow a procedure. Similarly, when a job is completed without an incident, it's easy to assume that all procedures were followed and all controls were applied. The Eurocontrol Guide to System Thinking for Safety says, when things go wrong in organizations, our assumption tends to be that something or someone malfunctioned or failed. When things go right, as they do most of the time, we assume that the system functions as designed and people work as imagined. Success and failure are therefore to thought to be fundamentally different. We think that there is something special about unwanted occurrences, and this assumption shapes our response. When things go wrong, we often seek to find and fix the broken component, the one root cause. When things go right, we pay no further attention. However, when wanted and unwanted events occur, in large complex organizations, people are often doing the same sort of things that they usually do, normal work. And what differs is the set of circumstances, interactions, and patterns of variability in performance. And that variability is normal and necessary and enables things to work most of the time. Normal work is about how people adapt to that variability, that is, to changing conditions and challenges as part of their job. For example, using a crane to lift a load. Every time an operator does it, there may be something different about the situation. For example, less time available than planned. Additional people in the area. One person being off work. Correct tools not available, for example, lifting slings. It's easy to see how these factors can increase the risk, and yet none of them would be classified as a hazard 
because none of them is a source of harm on its own. And popular approaches to safety management focus on controlling or identifying and controlling hazards, but often miss a whole world of organizational factors. Adapting to overcome these various challenges is part of what needs to be done. It's normal work. And learning from normal work is about looking into things that make that work difficult. So what does it all mean in practice? It means that the conditions that will create your next accident exist today. And we can find them and address them before they lead to that accident. But because these conditions are typically, it's difficult to um, categorize them as, as hazards. Let's do a deeper dive into comparison between hazards and, um, and those conditions. The list on the left shows a popular set of hazards, electricity, chemical exposure, noise, etc. Hazards are typically defined as something that has potential to cause harm. Compare that with the list of things on the right hand side. These things are called constraints, error traps or performance shaping factors. For example, incorrect procedure, insufficient amount of time, unfamiliar situation. It's difficult to call these constraint hazards. And this is one of the reasons why typical risk assessments would not capture them and would not introduce controls for them. The risk assessment may also focus on unsafe acts, but learning from normal work would go beyond that and look at unsafe acts as a form of adaptation to local constraints and conditions that are created by other people in the organization. And therefore, we're looking at how different teams depend on each other and how those dependencies may affect risk. And I'll show you some examples of that later. When it comes to reducing the risk, we often think about the hierarchy of controls. But this approach may not be as effective when it comes to addressing constraints such as incorrect procedure or wrong tools provided. Therefore, we talk about optimizations as a form of improvement rather than controlling as in engineering sense in the same way as you can possibly control, for example, physical substances or um, um, chemicals or some uh, energies. Who is learning from normal work? There are hundreds of organizations across various industries exploring proactive learning. Here you see just some of them from the energy sector and other industries, including pharmaceuticals, car manufacturing, electric power, or industrial technology. This topic is also being advanced by a number of industry bodies, including Flight Safety Foundation, that has published a guide to learning from normal work for the aviation industry specifically. And so now, having had that introduction, let me show you um, some examples. Learning from normal work can take different forms. Um, and so let's start with the leadership engagement, so leadership conversation. The typical leadership engagement is a conversation between a leader and a team member and it is the most basic yet extremely powerful tool to build desired safety culture. The focus and quality of an engagement depends on leaders' mindset around incident causation and their ability to ask open inquisitive questions. For example, if a leader believes that accidents happen due to non-compliance, they are likely to focus their approach and their questions just on that. Catching, policing, maybe punishing are not uncommon uh, examples. So instead of engagements focused on verifying compliance, leaders may focus on factors that make the work difficult and ask questions such as, what is getting in the way of completing this task safely? What makes this job difficult? What do you need to be set up for success? What do you need to complete this work safely? What is the advantage of doing it this way? That is particularly powerful uh, example. For example, imagine that you're um, doing your walk around or visiting a site and you've observed a person 
holding their hands close to the pinch point. So there is a risk of hand injury. Of course, we can correct them, that person, that operator immediately and say, please don't do this. But that would not help us to learn what is the advantage of doing that thing. With In that particular example, we often see that holding your hands close to the um, pinch points areas, for example, um, helps with precision or helps with control because holding your hands further away makes it more difficult to control the movement. There are other forces involved. It uh, affects your body overall uh, differently. So asking about the advantage of doing this thing is a, a very effective question. And one more, tell me about situations when you needed to deviate from procedures to complete the job talking about the variability, the conditions that change and how people deal with that. So having a conversations focused on um, learning and understanding what's behind um, uh, behavior is one way of learning from normal work. The second way is so-called walk through talk through. This is a real example uh, of a simple walk through talk through for the preventive preventative maintenance on a lathe machine. A walkthrough talkthrough is a simple technique that breaks the task into steps and discusses what makes each step difficult because different steps may have different failure modes and may be influenced by different conditions. So here on the left, we've got steps copied verbatim from the maintenance procedure. In the second column, we see the potential consequences if the step is misperformed. And here we see examples of constraints and varying conditions. So let's now focus on one of those steps, step three. This step is to check if the machine air pressure is 85 PSI because incorrect amount of pressure may damage the equipment. By talking to an operator, we realize that the gauge shows the pressure in megapascals. This means that the same pressure would be expressed with different numbers when using PSI and megapascals, and that could confuse the operator and lead to a mistake. And finally, we take these findings and discuss with the operator how to best address them. So an easy fix for step three is to update the procedure and use megapascals to make uh, those pressure units consistent with what is on the machine. Here we have an example of a simple learning team. A learning team is a discussion with people who do the activity and who influence how the work is done. So in our workshop, a team was working with these large poles. This is a seven ton spool being lifted with a standard 10 ton crane. You can see the size of the spool on the picture. The spool needed to be lifted 15 centimeters, six inches and moved across the room. You would think, well, OK, that's not that difficult to do, but it is. One of the things that we picked up on was that the operator was a little too close to the spool. And the reason was the crane control was a cable type system, which was limiting where the operator could stand and what he could see before requiring a spotter. Now, please note how the operator was forced by the work environment to be close to the line of fire. The spotter on the other side of the spool, the spotter was on the other side of the spool and it was difficult to see each other. So they had to use verbal commands. When we started looking at the crane controls, it had left, right, forward and backwards type buttons on them. So depending on the orientation of the spotter versus the crane operator and the limited visibility, you could easily make a mistake in the direction you wanted the crane to move. We decided that if they just use a remote control and put some directional indicators using things like east and west, and then line up the equipment so that everything was moving in a particular direction. The crane operator now could move around and he always knew what direction he was going. 
And by making this simple improvement, we eliminated the need for the spotter and for using verbal communication. If you think about moving large loads like this, it could result in a life-changing injury if someone was struck by it. The team was able to identify conditions that could result in the mistake and they eliminated the potential for injury. Now, there are some very important lessons from here. Please note that if there was an accident during this lifting activity, we would probably have found exactly the same things we found now. The conditions that will create your next accidents exist today, just people deal with them effectively most of the time. Number two, any attempts to change the behavior of the operator without changing how the work was set up would have a very limited impact because the operator's position where they could stand and what they could see was forced by the equipment and the positioning that uh, they had to use. Number three, improvements that eliminated the risk of an accident in this scenario were in managerial control and not necessarily in control of their operators. Operators were not in a position to um, change the design um, or change how the work is done but they were more than happy to tell us about what they need. And lastly, things we found and addressed could not be categorized as hazards and therefore would not show up in the risk assessment. And if in our safety management, identifying and controlling hazards is the main focus, as important as it is, we are missing a big chunk of what make the work safe. This is an example of a more advanced learning team that looked into dependencies between different teams. We sat together with a broad group of people, including workshop operators, foreman, HSC, operation leader, logistics and manufacturing engineering team, and asked them about what makes their work difficult in relation to complex lifts of um, large loads. The conversation helps us to identify over 30 improvements opportunities. Here are some highlights. Firstly, operators told us that the information that they need, such as weight, the center of gravity or type of slings, is not easy and convenient to access. There are just a few laptops in the workshop. It takes time to walk to them. There may be somebody using it, or if you rarely use the computers, you could forget your password. It's difficult to locate the information that you need in the database. All those things take more time than you have available to prepare for the lift. And sometimes people were not using it, relying on their past experience. We've heard that sometimes important information was not available in the database or it was incomplete. And some operators who may be involved in those lifts did not have sufficient skills and haven't had the right type of complex lift training. So to address those issues, we've introduced tablets, making improvements to the usability of the database to make the information easy and convenient to access. In other words, to make it easy to do the right thing. We've changed how the information for the complex lift is provided and added cross checks to ensure the information is correct. We are also training all operators on complex lifting techniques. These are some just example, uh, some just some examples, but we were able to address that because we had people from different teams who depend on each other. Um, and that is another important aspect of effective, proactive learning. People who do the job are critical to learn from but they're not the full story. We need people who influence the conditions that uh, affect how the work is done, uh, people who provide resources. And in that particular case, uh, information was a big theme, a big topic that needed to be addressed. And again, if you think about what we found, 
the difficulties, for example, to usability of the database that would not be categorized as hazard and typically would not show up in the risk management and risk control measures. A popular question um, in response to uh, those stories is, OK, but we have thousands of, job, of jobs. How do you decide where to focus? First of all, the prioritization is done at the site level, although it may be informed by the corporate considerations. And there are a few simple ways to start. You can take your existing incident trends, but focus on activity instead of a type of accident. So for example, a hand injury is a type of an accident and not an activity. We should not focus on the injury itself, but on the tasks that resulted in this injury. So for example, welding, pipe assembly. Because if you ask uh, the questions about what makes it difficult, walk me through the steps, will not work, will not make sense if you focus on the injury. And so that's why it's important to go level deeper and understand what are the tasks that resulted. And therefore, the focus is on task, not on an injury. Um, a second approach is to use your existing risk matrix for every location. You probably will have a risk matrix indicating which activities have the potential for the most severe outcomes. You can use your project plan data. So, for example, frequency of high risk activities over next six months combined with location data, simultaneous operations or the number of personnel in the area that will also help you to create a risk profile. Critical task screening is an advanced quantitative technique that you can Google, but I won't cover it today. Uh, but you can also talk to people as they will have experience and intuition about what is concerning. And so, for example, you can talk to HSC, operations, project managers, and get their uh, perspective on um, what is concerning to them. And if they say, let's say, lifting in that area, then you can talk to the operators, people who do the job, and first of all, check what is concerning to them. And if they also say lifting, then you can explore further uh, which cranes, in what areas, with what lifts are most troublesome. And so you will get, in that way, you will get that uh, access to the local experience of people and um, and their um, understanding of what is most problematic, where things almost fail, what is most difficult, um, etc. So these are some some strategies that can be used. Another popular comment that I hear is that we are learning from normal work already. We may we may not call it that way, but we do because we have these processes such as field verification, audits, after actions reviews, procedure reviews, etc. And that is good and important part of the equation. But then the question is how these tools are actually applied, what they actually focus on, checking compliance, testing awareness, verifying availability of paperwork, or constraints, error traps, adaptations, dependencies, and whether using these tools and processes result in meaningful action and tangible risk reduction. Throughout my career, I've seen procedure reviews that focused on verifying compliance instead of on learning what makes compliance difficult. I've seen field verifications that didn't ask operators uh, any questions, took a lot of time and resulted in zero improvements. I've seen audits that resulted in people hiding things instead of revealing the challenges. So having the process is part of the picture, but is not the full picture. Leaders sometimes ask why they should deploy their limited resources to learn from normal work, while there are lots of failures to learn from. And so let's at the high level compare, reflect on the costs, um, difference in costs between incident investigations and learning from normal work. In terms of the basic training to prepare people, 
learning from normal work training will take much less time to get people started. I'm not talking about um, mastery level, but just to get people started. The time needed for actual investigation, so information collection, again, is much shorter for proactive learning. In case of learning from normal work, there is no failure or accident, and so people are more relaxed and keen to share their experience. While during the investigations, people often tend to be careful with what they say, the emotions may be strong and tension uh, on ongoing, and so learning is far more difficult in that atmosphere. And if you assume the cost of a life-changing injury, including a broad range of direct and indirect costs, to be between hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, then the financial cost of proactive learning is a tiny fraction of that, around 0.002% for the cost of people's time and any small effects on production. Because proactive learning is a planned effort, you can fit it in into lower workloads, um, et cetera. To help organizations to transition to proactive learning, IOGP will publish a new guide on proactive learning. I've had the privilege to lead the writing effort. It's been approved by over 40 senior and executive leaders across the upstream segments. It will be published later this year. It was called The Game Changer in Accident Prevention. I'll show you what's inside in a second. But um, it's great to have a reference document, but on its own, document is not sufficient to create change. So we need an implementation system to make it happen in practice. And so as part of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, SPE, Human Factors Technical Section, and building on years of hands-on experience in implementing proactive learning, we've developed the implementation system. Our experience shows that in order to benefit from proactive learning, three elements need to be in place. A new mindset that includes understanding of constraints, error traps, what's behind on compliance, the role of workarounds, dependencies, etc. A new set of skills focused on how to ask questions that open people up and find local constraints, dilemmas, and trade offs. And a new set of tools such as enhanced leadership visits, walk through, talk through, or learning teams. The SP implementation system addresses all three of these essentials in a way that is scalable. It provides new perspectives and language for leaders so that they can create pool for integrating this approach into ways of working. It builds a range of hands-on skills in practitioners to apply those techniques, and it contains step-by-step -step guidance on how to use those tools. So what's inside? The content was designed to help to address the mindset, skill set, and tool set. And it combines an interactive e learning package with practical application and group discussions. The toolkit takes you through eight short chapters that cover three main areas modernizing our thinking on what creates safety. Here we explore the psychology of non compliance, the role of workarounds, adaptations, how dependencies between teams affect risk level. Then barriers and enablers. We explain the effect called what you look for is what you find, how our biases make us focus more on behaviors than on how the work is set up, and we introduce basics of modern just culture based on the restorative justice principles. Finally, we talk about tools and uh, questioning techniques. And in chapter seven, we learn um, the the tools itself, um, the walk through, talk through, uh, learning team um, leadership um, engagement. Here you see a screenshot from the course. On the right hand side, you see professionally illustrated content, and on the left hand side, you see the chapters. Each chapter consists of a few short videos followed by a quiz and a micro task to help you apply the concepts in practice. And learning the new concepts combined with doing small practical tasks and group discussion as part of the rollout results in a rapid shift in how people think about safety and their ability to find and address constraints. There are a number of organizations who participated in phase one of the um, rollout, and here are some reviews. Very useful insights to understand how important it is to change our approach to incidents if we want to create a much safer organization. 
or before the course, I thought that most accidents were caused by people's poor decisions. However, now I think that the context of the situation drives people's actions. So who is this for? Mainly for business leaders, including HSC, Ops, Engineering, Planning. We design it with the recognition that safety is an organizational challenge, more so than the behavioral challenge. In terms of the amount of time uh, that it takes, it depends on how you deploy it. You could go through all the content in one go, and that would take about 90 minutes, but it would be extremely ineffective way. Uh, it is much more effective for teams to go through the content together, spread the rollout over five to eight weeks, and combine it with micro and group discussions. In this scenario, the participants would need between 60 to 90 minutes per week, and such design prevents disturbing ongoing activities while maximizing the retention and skill development impossible to achieve through, for example, one day long workshop or watching 90 minutes of content in one call. And so what are the next steps if you happen to be interested? You probably have more questions. So go to learningfromnormalwork.com and there you can learn more. Um, you will find that some um, infographics as well that um, I've used today and uh, you can book a call. The course will not be publicly available until the publication of the IOGP a guide, but we offer limited access to selected companies who want to get ahead of the game. It will take time to get it started. Alliance stakeholders have internal conversations, etc. So the earlier you start the area, you will see the benefits. And I believe that proactive learning, learning from normal work is the future of safety. Adding the understanding of constraints, dependencies, and some other organizational factors to our set of tools and processes um, is an important step forward. Um, and so by taking the advantage of these resources, you can get ahead of your competitors, impress your customers, and join the small group of the most advanced organizations. So with this said, thank you so much for your uh, attention and um, let's um, let's explore any questions that you may have. Um, I see some. Thank you very much, John. Um, uh, I see some additional welcomes and good mornings in the chat. So um, that's uh, great to see. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, for joining uh, early morning or late afternoon. Um, yes, the slides will be available and the recording of the presentation will also be uh, shared with you uh, in a couple um, days. Um, so one person says, I think um, also could key findings from self verification audits, which should trigger review of the critical tasks where the findings have been identified. Um, yeah, so those processes is a great platform, um, but the question, I, I will revisit the question, it's great to have the process, but what, what does this process and the questions within focus on? Um, and what type of outcomes you get? So uh, I think there, in many cases, I've seen there is opportunity to extend the set of questions to go beyond just verifying compliance and checking the paperwork in place to look into what makes it difficult, what makes it challenging, under what conditions you may need to deviate, what would set you up for success. Those questions reveal um, aspects of work that just simple verification uh, and checking compliance does not um, give you. Um, Richard asks, who should be included in the learning team? Um, Richard, that depends on the topic, uh, the task and the scope. Um, so if you've got simple activity uh, and you want to do a quick review, then it may be enough to talk to a few operators, uh, that, like you've seen with uh, that example uh, with the spools. However, um, if the activity is more complex, um, then you may want to invite other uh, other people who have impact on how that work is done or own processes associated. So who owns the procedure? Who owns the tools? Who owns the uh, resources provided? Who does the planning? Um, and those people uh, can be uh, can be invited. Um, and so the output tend to be rich 
um, rich insights into different aspects of conditions that make the work difficult, as well as constraints that affect not only the operators, but also um, those other uh, people. Um, how do you know if people are speaking openly? Do you consider psychological safety assessment within teams? So I suppose there are a couple aspects. So um, there may be less formal and more formal ways. Um, when you talk to people, um, you will get a gut feel. Um, you're, you will have your, your emotional response to their body language, to their tone of voice, more or less conscious response. But uh, we are very sensitive to the um, to those nonverbal uh, messages. So, um, so that's one. Um, yes, in the course we do introduce uh, psychological um, safety, and you can do that as well. Um, there are some um, simple surveys that um, you can do with the team. So that's definitely possible. Um, absolutely, the level of trust affects um, the people's willingness to be open and. Uh, speak up freely, um, no question, uh, no question about it, and that's one of the conditions as well that needs to be created to learn um, uh, effectively. Um, methodologies that show work is done, such as from cast ergonomics reports, help us to learn from normal work too. Absolutely, um, but those uh, you mentioned, um, however, are more on the advanced. Uh, side of the of the spectrum of tools. So I didn't cover them today because they require far more um, uh, education and exposure to to do it well. But the point is that there are more tools to what I um, shown you uh, today. Um, and those different tools are at different levels of um, sophistication um, and complexity. Um, OK, thank you. And um, Ahmad says, how often the human factor studies being reviewed? Do we have an indicator where we can apply and get results? Or is it just depends on statistical data? The risk registers are becoming huge. How can we improve the awareness of the risk management effectively? Um, OK, so a couple questions here. Um, Ahmad, I. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean by human factor studies. So human factor is a big discipline with many different tools. Um, so I don't know if you are referring to any specific particular uh, approach. Um, and so um, do we have indicators where we can apply and get a result? So where, how, so how, how do we know where we can apply the proactive um, learning. And so in my experience, there are some more advanced techniques like critical task screening you can do, and some organizations do it. It's an important part of the safety critical task analysis that is part of the regulatory framework in the UK, and that's good. Um, I also I, I found that uh, in practice, this is often a combination of uh, a, um, a conversation and an available uh, available um, information that may include your past incidents, your understanding of risk, um, your um, your risk study. So the point is start somewhere, start somewhere, and then you will continue optimizing um, and uh, improving your process and approach uh, as uh, as you go. Um, Sure, uh, Run. I will send the recording to um, to everyone. Um, great, thank you for your kind words. Um, okay. Um, demonstration of learning from normal work is one of the best ways of demonstrating healthy safety culture. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, because the um, effective proactive learning uh, requires free flow of information and lots of trust um, and addressing the actions in a way that are helpful um, to people doing the job. So de definitely. Um, thank you, Debbie. Um, 
I would suggest the learnings should also be captured in corporate or even industry standards to improve from a wide um, root resolution as possible. That's a great point, Tim. And I expect this would be a next wave or the next stage of uh, developing this at the um, uh, at the industry uh, level, um, where we start sharing the insights from this proactive uh, learning uh, as uh, in addition to or on top of the sharing lessons learned from uh, from accidents. Um, it's very important to uh, involve experienced, knowledgeable people since they know the task better, hence we would be able to support best to ensure the quality of this exercise. Um, absolutely, um, Roman, that's why people doing the job is a critical part. Involving those people is a critical part of proactive um, of proactive uh, learning. Um, thank you, Roman. Um, can a walkthrough talk through be generated and carried out by anybody? Technicians, uh, for instance. Yes, it can. Um, but there are um, cap a few enablers um, that can make it effective or ineffective uh, approach. So the the walkthrough talk through um, can be done in different ways. So it can be just a conversation focused on, hey, tell me about the main steps on this job. And then let's talk through them. So no forms, no writing down, nothing. And that's that's a conversation. That's the easier part. Now, the advantage of it is informal nature of that approach. The disadvantage is that you will be relying on your memory when it comes to um, addressing any findings. So the uh, using the form, um, although may initially um, you know add, add that aspect of formality because you're writing down things although often operators just you know get on with it um, it gives you a more detailed overview because it's more systematically going through the template uh, and you're recording the findings and therefore now you've got a record and um, it can help you uh, later that's number one number two is template is just a tool and it can be used or misused and the template alone, I wouldn't just go, hey, here you go, template, and off you go. Um, the mindset that people have um, will make it effective or not. So if they believe that accidents are caused by, um, by for, let's say, complacency and unsafe acts and people being lazy, the tool, the, the template will be of secondary importance. They will ask questions that will focus on those aspects. Tell me about when you get complacent, et cetera. And so the results will not be as useful uh, overall. And therefore, some preparation to help people to understand, ask about things external to the person, ask about the aspects of the work environment, um, and then helping them with some questioning techniques, questions that close people down and uh, open them up. Uh, we go through that in the course as well. Uh, how to ask questions um, that make people feel more relaxed uh, and um, make them more willing to uh, to contribute would be some conditions. But the technique itself is sufficiently simple that with some preparation it can be done um, by by technicians. Although, as I mentioned earlier, typically the findings to address the findings we need involvement of um, management because typically those tools will capture something about the work setup that uh, operators or technicians may not. Um, it may be out of their um, control. Um, thank you, um, Germanio. Um, Albert, the challenge is to change the mind of organizations to invest in learning instead of spending time for investigation, but confident the change will happen because the time spent up front is very worthwhile. Absolutely. There is a business case uh, to that. It is a challenge. Uh, I agree, um, Albert, and uh, scale is one of the challenges for this. Um, you, you say the challenge is to change the mind of organizations. That's absolutely right. Uh, how I understand that is uh, in large organizations, we may have thousands, tens of thousands of, of people, and it's not enough to prepare one team or one group uh, on a site or, or somewhere because when they come up with, they apply the findings and they come up with useful insights, 
that will may not resonate with people who are not on the same page. Um, and so getting an organization to the same to the same level is a big challenge. And so that's why I was uh, when we were designing uh, this SPE toolkit, we we had that in mind, how to do it in a way that uh, could scale and in a relatively short period of time expose a large group of people um, to those concepts and, uh, and ideas. Um, Debbie, I think there is a big interest in the availability for individuals to do a course. Um, our employer is not yet ready for this on a big scale, uh, sadly. Um, uh, thank you, um, Debbie. I would say let's talk. Um, we're still um, making final refinements before the uh, final uh, launch uh, with the IOGP uh, guide. So. Um, Options are different. Options are on the table. I encourage you to um, to um, to uh, arrange a chat so we can explore how we can how we can help. Um, Tony, a very positive course. Does this course follow on from the previous sessions? Are the previous sessions available? Tony, I don't know what you're referring to by previous sessions. Um, the course I'm referring to is a self-containing um self-containing unit um that brings the um the, the different concepts and tools that over the years i found most uh most effective um it does use number of human factors human performance topics uh there uh, some people said that it's a great introduction to human performance as well uh, and because of its practical uh aspects um it's uh, even even better than some of the um, um, solutions um, that may be uh, out there. Um, OK, thank you. Um, OK, uh, Paul, what are the biggest barriers, in your opinion, to actually learning from adverse events in the past? OK, so that would be the um, learning from accidents or reactive learning, as I understand. Uh, Paul. So I would say that the biggest obstacle is the our understanding of accident causation. Because of the effect, what you look for is what you find. Your beliefs and assumptions about the how the accident causation happens informs your question, that informs the evidence you collect, that informs the findings that you get. So uh, we still there is a dominant uh, the dominant perspective that remains that I see is that it were it is a human behavior uh, that is often the cause and uh, that there is one or limited number of uh, root causes um, and that behavior whether error or non-compliance tends to dominate uh, and people tend to finish the conclusions with that um, so shifting that mindset is one thing to see the incident as an interaction between many contributing factors that evolved over time. Um, the second one is a good use of human factors, tools and techniques to understand, uh, accurately describe why it makes sense to people, ability to, um, to um, account for the context and the situation and tell the story how that um, affected. Um, and so there is much more work, I think, to be done at the industry level um, to help organizations with that. But the good uh, important step forward is the IOGP guide to demystifying human factors in investigation. So uh, please check that out. Uh, do you consider weak signals? OK, great question, Philip. Um, so the question would be, what is a weak signal? Um, and that's something that may be defined differently by different uh, people, but ultimately, yes, this is something that is of concern to somebody. For example, a vibration there, and we definitely would like to uh, would like to hear about that, uh, what it was, what's behind it, when, under what conditions um, it, it it's happening, etc. So, if the language of weak signals uh, is well understood in your organization, then absolutely um, uh, it can be um, used. Um, Frank, do you have any recommendations on further reading um, on learning from a normal work? Um, 
Okay, so I would start with the basics. So the basics may be the uh, book from Todd Conklin on pre-accident investigations and learning better questions. There are two books um, written by um, um, by by other people on um, learning teams specifically. So learning team is a, a technique. I showed you this on um, on in my examples, but not the only um, technique. Um, what else with proactive learning? Um, <laughs> and I would I would perhaps encourage you to think about uh, human factors aspects. So understanding uh, a range of um, constraints and how they work from what makes design unintuitive, for example, what makes design confusing to how the fatigue works because fatigue is not limited to tiredness, to how attention works um, and how attention is drawn and what attracts that. And and so there is, I, I think, the bigger umbrella for the um, development in the areas of human factors um, that uh, that can be used to enhance our mental model of how individual group and organizational behavior works. So I see that there are many other questions that um, I didn't manage to answer uh, in the time we have. Um, thank you so much for um, for your questions. What we'll, I will try to do is take your questions and answer them offline and include it in the email that Carolyn will send you jointly with um, with the video. So um, so um, that um, you will get that. Um, and again, thank you so much uh, for your time today and your kind words. Um, Carolyn, back to you. Thank you. So um, it just takes for me to um, thank you, um, Marcin, for another most excellent presentation, very informative, um, to remind you all that the slides and the recording will be available after the session. Um, and thank you all very much for your time this morning, your interests and your participation. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And if there's anything that you'd like to contact us regarding um, after the session, you see my contact details there. Otherwise, have a great day and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you again.